Well, good morning and a very warm welcome. I'm Mike Gray, Capability and Resourcing Manager at Health Education England. Thanks for joining the Major Projects Association Research and Development Keynote Speaker Session on the final day of the NHS Project Futures Festival 2022. Just before I hand over to Manon, may I just let you know the format of the virtual event. You'll see on the right of the hand of the screen, a panel detailed chat and Q&A. The chat is perhaps obvious and the Q&A is for you to put questions to Manon as you think of them. So do get involved. The game code will have been given at the screen at the beginning of the session for arriving on time. You can write this down in the notes tab at the right hand side of the screen. You'll be given a, co a game code at the end of the session as well. Towards the end of Manon's presentation, there will be time for a Q and A's, depending on the number of questions, but please get them through and we'll get those voted. We're delighted to welcome Manon Bradley for the, from the Major Projects Association. Manon is the Development Director for the Major Projects Association, the purpose of which is to improve the initiation and delivery of major projects. She's also Founding Director of Strength to Strength, a consultancy specialising in helping companies to understand their barriers to a full and inclusive workforce. Her knowledge has led her to establish the Major Projects Association Gender Balance, Gender Balance Initiative, which frames the issues of diversity as a challenge for the whole sector to improve performance. In this capacity, Manon chairs the Infrastructure Client Group Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Group. She's also a member of the advisory board for the Women in Construction Summit, serves on the steering committee for, uh, of UCL research study into women in major projects leadership and is a mentor to similar work being undertaken at the University of Sussex. In her spare time, Manon is a competitive drug-free powerlifter. In the 16 years she's been competing, she's won 13 world championships, nine European championships and held seven world records and a host of British titles. She's delighted and honoured to be awarded the Oxfordshire Sportswoman of the Year. Thank you, Manon, and a very warm welcome to you on behalf of the Project and Change community. Good morning, all, and thank you, Mike, for that lovely introduction. I should also say I knit as well, so just in, in case anybody thinks I'm being a bit sloppy and lazy, making full use of my time. Um, we've, I can see Mike giggling away on the screen there. We've had a great deal of fun planning today's session, uh, and I only hope that that comes through uh, and that you have as much fun listening to what I have to say this morning. So let's see if I can work the tech. That would be a good start, wouldn't it? There you go. So. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Major Projects Association, who we are, what we do, um, and what benefits you can get out of it. Um, I'm using the slides as an aid memoir for me, really. Don't feel that you have to, to write anything down. Some of the slides, the, the typeface is so small, you can't see it anyway. So don't, don't worry about that at all. Um, Mike, if you did want the slide deck to share with, with everybody afterwards, I'm very happy to share that. Um, but don't panic about reading anything. So who, who are we? Who's the Major Projects Association? Well, we are a membership body for organisations that are actively involved in the initiation and delivery of major projects. And as Mike said, our purpose is about improving the initiation and delivery of major projects. Um, so everything, we, every single thing we do, every conversation, every report, every bit of research is all held, is all put through that filter of does it help to improve initiation and delivery of major projects and if the answer is yes we'll try to do it and if the answer is no well then we won't bother uh, so um, but we are a community of practice so you can see on the screen now just some of the organizations that are members so some of those will be uh, will be big projects themselves like Tideway, High Speed 2, quite a lot actually of government departments which are the clients um, involved in delivering projects so DFT uh, Department of Health and Social Care as well uh, Department for Work and Pensions we have academic members as well and I'll come back to that in a little in a little while um, but the, the, the rule I suppose about major projects association membership is that it's about engagement and involvement uh, and organizations that join just don't turn up uh, and we don't see anything of them leave again. 
uh, it's a little th those people are a little bit like the ones that pay their their gym membership at the end of the year never turn up and then wonder why they haven't lost any weight so it's very much about active membership and being part of the community and um, much of what we do is for members only but speaking to mike and because i'm so uh, pleased to see that uh, the nhs projects futures project community is taking project delivery so seriously there's a number of things which ordinarily i'd say look these are for members only but if there's anybody that's taking part today that says actually man and i'd really like to come to that event i'd really like to read that report just drop me a note um, and mike can share my email address with you i'm very very happy to extend some of those benefits out to you so as development director um, i'm responsible for membership for making sure that we create this community that we we give you know good value for money for our members, that we manage our reports, our studies, uh, and I lead on one of our landmark objectives, and I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> what we do, this is uh, a very dull slide, it's really just to say that we try to do things in an interesting way to get people talking about the challenges of delivering major projects, uh, whether that's through events, discussions and research, as well as through our landmark objectives. And the backbone of what we do is our events program. So when I started, I joined MPA in uh, 2005. And, and then at that point, we delivered six seminars and about half a dozen other little bits and pieces, you know, a, a big dinner and then maybe a breakfast meeting. Um, we now do that in a quarter, if not in a month. Uh, so we deliver lots of seminars breakfast meetings, discussion round tables, um, chief executive get togethers, you name it, all, all type of virtual events. And, and thankfully, you're now getting back to some face to face activities, which is lovely. Um, and everything we talk about is related to major projects initiation and delivery. Um, so we do uh, the, the things that you can see on there are the February events. I think yeah, that's February 2022 events. Um, you know, and it just that just gives you a little a little flavour in itself. Because if I look there, yeah, risk management. That's what that one says. Just looking at my screen. So risk management. We'd be talking about new aspects of managing risk within a, within a project setting, um, and reflecting on COP twenty six. So we're we're sort of deep diving on issues around sustainability. All of it related to major projects. Um, I'm hoping that this bit you're going to be really interested in because MPA has the largest knowledge repository relating to major project initiation and delivery in the world. In the world, Mike, it's the biggest in the world. Um, I don't know if it is actually, but nobody's ever challenged me on that. I, I keep saying it, I'm waiting for somebody at a university somewhere to say, well, I think ours is bigger, but, but we've got a huge number, thousands of, of documents, podcasts, videos, any type of uh, content with, about uh, initiation delivery of major projects. So for example, we've got all the Crossrail Learning Legacy documentation on that. We've got, we've already started the High Speed Learning Legacy. It's being streamed directly into our uh, website. We've got NAO reports. We've got government reports and documents. We've got templates. We've got best practice from all parts of the supply chain, clients through, through suppliers and all different types of projects. So they might be transformational, they might be oil and gas, they might be infrastructure, or anything you can think of that's about major projects, uh, you will be able to find in that repository. And the great news is that most of it is freely available to anybody. So you don't need to be, you, you do need to log on, you need to register on the website, but you don't need to be an MPA member to get access to all of this stuff. Um, so I really encourage you, go and have a look, find out what's there. And, uh, and, and an offer for this day only is if you see something that's actually sitting there behind the paywall and you think, actually, I'd really like to read that report. That would be really relevant to my job. Just get, get in touch, get in touch. I'm, I'm sure I can just download it and send it to you. We do do, do do, she said, we do do 
a bit of continuing professional development. Um, some is members only, and I won't bother you with that for the minute, but there's two chunks of it which are available to non-members, and I'll just pause for a moment and tell you about those. So the one that's lit up in orange is called the Challenge of Major Projects. We deliver that course once a year. It's, it's aimed at people that are walking into a, or, or just starting a leadership role within a major undertaking. So in infrastructure terms, and it's not all about infrastructure, but in infrastructure terms, that would typically be hundreds of millions of pounds worth of, of projects. Um, in transformational terms, those figures don't make so much sense because transformational projects don't necessarily cost the same as infrastructure. Um, but what I would say to you on that is, is it's about taking on an undertaking which is above and beyond anything you or the organisation had any experience with. Um, and that's a course, uh, it's, it, there, is a, there is a price tag to it. It's about £4,000. Uh, we've just recently changed the numbers, so sorry to be vague. Um, and we deliver it partly in person and partly virtual over the course of a month. It's actually this month. So uh, anybody that's interested in that has missed the boat for this year, but we'll be delivering it next February and March. So you might want to start thinking about um, having a look at that. Um, and I'm, I'm just checking, Mike, that you are, give me the thumbs up if you are putting these links in the chat, people. Good job. Oh, I should have said that. My, my um, uh, attractive assistant, Mike, if they do it like that. My glamorous assistant, Mike, is, uh, is sharing all the various links for you. So you should be getting links now to these to this um, page on our website. The other uh, piece of CPD that we deliver, which you'd be hopefully be really interested in, is the Major Projects Simulator. Now, this is a really, really good workshop. And I, and I say that because we it's actually a, a different company that delivers it for us, a company called Prendo. We've been delivering it since 2007. We've never had a single piece of bad feedback, and we do seek it every, every time. It's brilliant. So you play the role, you and a, a, a small group of, of others, maybe three or four in a team, you play the role of Pat Malloy, project manager, who is having to build a football stadium. So you get your briefing document from the chief executive and you're told, go up to Birmingham United and uh, work out how best to build this football stadium. So you have to, you have to choose your contractors, choose your contract and strategy, to, you know, determine what risks are available, communicate properly and effectively with all of your stakeholders, manage your finances, manage your timings, uh, and make sure you deliver this thing when it's when it needs to be delivered in readiness for the next football season um, and tickets at the right price such that you can uh, claim that money, but you know, make that money back in a reasonable time scale. It's really, really good fun. Uh, and there's a prize for the winner, winning team. It used to be a box of chocolates, but now we make a donation to charity because it's quite difficult to share boxes of chocolates when you're doing it virtually. But um, so I really recommend you do that. Uh, hopefully, Chris, uh, Mike has put in the link in the chat now. Um, it, our next session is a virtual session, which is, which is great. It's on the 22nd of June. Uh, it's 280 quid uh, if you wanted to come to that. And so if you've got any learning and development budgets need spending <laughs> before the end of the year, get it in, get in there. Because uh, we're not really limited on numbers with it being virtual. So I, I did mention infrastructure before. There's, there's a bit of a, a, a misconception around that MPA only talks about infrastructure, um, which, which I, I battle against all the time uh, and, and try to give lots of examples of non-infrastructure type things. I mean, of course, we do talk about infrastructure because you look at the biggest projects in the UK and in, in Europe at the moment, and they're, they're rail projects, you know, they're tunnel you know Thames Tideway tunnel high speed two um it's also easy to understand the language around infrastructure you know you're going to build something you understand about construction so on and so forth um but that's why we try really hard to make sure that any events we do any studies that we undertake are applicable to all sorts of major undertakings so I wanted to bring this uh, this is an example to you. 
we every year we dedicate a small part of our budget to to studies we call them studies not research because they're you know research tends to be millions of pounds and in academic institutions what we do is we use the power of our community to get together groups of interested people do some deep dives into particular issues and then write them up in a way that's useful uh, for the rest of the community so this is an example of one of those where um, we started with an idea around the, the the concept of project initiation, that there would be a key set of questions or a key set of conversations, which if you had them early on, would help you to frame your project as effectively as possible and be really clear about what the purpose is and what the vision is. Um, so we produced this report that just came out about a month ago on better early project conversations. And these will be relevant all of your projects you know none of them are about construction or concrete or digging holes in the ground they're all about what are we doing who is it for who's going to be affected who's going to operate and maintain the thing Mike and I had a great conversation about that yesterday what assumptions are being made uh, and what's what's new and unique about this project you know can we can we copy and steal from anybody else so it's very much about the human side of, of project initiation so that's that report is does sit behind our paywall it is members only but if you would like to see it i can share that uh, either with michael or with people directly so just give me a shout if you want to see that i mentioned uh, that we have academic members um, we have about 12 academic members and that really stems from our background so we the mpa grew out of a piece of research at Oxford University looking at what was the critical difference between big projects, you know, really big mega projects and the kind of six weeks, six months, you know, fairly routine projects. Um, and the, the finding was, the decision was that actually major, huge mega projects have significantly more in common with one another, regardless of what sector they're in, than any commonality with a smaller project within their own sector. Because, of course, the challenges that you face when you're delivering something of scale is around the huge size of it, the enormous time scales, the, the large number of interfaces that you're having to deal with. And of course, an enormous risk register. So we, we very much like to maintain our connection with the academic community. <clears throat> um, and one of the ways that we do this is through our PhD research grants. And like I say, don't worry about trying to read this because it's tiny, tiny writing, even on my huge screen. So you may not be able to see that. But we give PhD research grants. The money's not huge. Um, it, you know, they're not fully funded in any way, but the money is the lure to, to hook, hook in some applicants to apply in the hope that what we do is we establish a conversation between academics and practitioners such that the academics have an opportunity to test their theories with the practitioner community um, in real time, as it were. So to compare what they think is going on with the lived reality of people that are actually doing the job. Um, and we've had some great successes uh, uh, with those PhD grants that have now been running for ooh, 11 years. No, 20, 12 years. That's quite exciting, isn't it? So right at the very beginning, I said we have a number of key landmark objectives. Um, I'm going to expand on just the first two of these, environmental sustainability and diversity, uh, because the, the one on project capability is still really in its infancy uh, and I'm not leading on it and I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but don't, you don't need to read that slide. I'm going to go into a bit more detail now. <clears throat> So back in 2019, we had our annual conference around the theme of sustainability and, um, and a circular economy and trying to get closer to net zero. And of course, that's, that has particular relevance in the major project sector when we use so much. Um, so we, we had a fantastic conference. And at the end of it, we made a number of uh, we set a number of objectives for ourselves in terms of what we wanted to do to carry forward. We didn't want to just have a have a conference, say, yes, we need to do something good and then let it go. 
our plan was that we needed to mobilise the major projects community such that we were doing something, making a difference. So what we did, <coughs> excuse me, we set up uh, a community of, we call them sustainability ambassadors. We've got about 50 of them, 40 or 50 of them. And, uh, and those ambassadors are just so passionate about this topic. And they come to us and they say, we should do this, we should do that. We should do a seminar on the impact that electric cars is going to make. We should do a seminar on, you know, the impact of nuclear power. We should do a, a session on, you know, can we actually break, us, break ourselves away from using concrete all the time? So we've been having brilliant conversations, <coughs> um, many of which are videoed or recorded in some way, and they'll sit on our website. We've produced lots of reports <coughs> and had lots of events. Um, we also agreed that we would identify some pledges that would be of value and relevance to individuals or organisations working in this space. And that just shows you what, what we came up with. Um, and that's, that's on our website. If you wanted to go and take a look and see if they're relevant for you, please do that. We also uh, put some money into developing a sustainability resource guide. Um, and, and I should say at this point, all of our work on sustainability, because we think it's so important, uh, it doesn't sit behind a paywall. So this is all freely, this stuff is freely available. So go and have a look um, and see whether it's of value to you and your project. I, I would love to, to do a live flow through this for you, but I'm always really nervous about relying on live links and the Wi-Fi suddenly going down because because the Russians have have done a cyber attack. <laughs> um, so I've just done a, a screen share um, rather than actually a live link. But this is a resource guide, which is phenomenal because it, it follows the different uh, stages of the life cycle of your project. And within each of those, it says, right, what might you want to do? What, what sort of sustainability action could you undertake? And if you click on those different boxes, it then takes you to a list of resources uh, which are rated, they've been rated by our ambassadors as to uh, how good we think they are. <clears throat> and then you can have a little look on them and go, oh, right, okay, there's a template there on how to assess uh, environmental assessment um, of a particular project. So we'll follow that, we'll use that template. Um, so like I say, go and take a look. Um, I, I think our website is, is good for some things. Some things it's a bit messy, but on this particular instance, it's fantastic. So go and have a little look and, and play around with that. And if you've got any suggestions, if we've missed stuff, if there's resources that you, that you know about that you'd like to share with us, do please uh, drop me a note. <clears throat> uh, we take the same approach to our work on diversity in terms of it being freely available uh, because we think it's too important to hide behind a paywall. Um, and there's a bit of another bit of history to this, a little bit more history to our work on EDI, um, which is that in 2000, well, when I joined the association in 2005, I had come from uh, a charity background. So charity sector, 60% female. I was used to being surrounded by women, working with women all the time. Uh, I joined the Major Projects Association and I look around me and back then particularly, uh, lot of grey-haired men, huge number of grey-haired men. Uh, lovely, lovely grey-haired men, but you know, and I, I was sort of saying, where, where are all the women? You know, where are all the women in this space? You know, I'm, I'm used to being in a very mixed environment. So after a decade of asking the question, come on, where are they all? Um, the evidence was coming out of uh, McKinsey about the impact of having diverse boards. Uh, there was a lot of evidence that said organisations which have got gender balance on the board, and they were particularly looking at gender balance back then, uh, a lot of evidence that says if you've got gender balance on your board, uh, your board is more effective, it, you know, better returns on investment, you know, all the financial targets were, were ticked. Um, so I went to our board and I said, look, if this is true of an organisation's board, it must be true of project teams. Uh, I, can't, I can't see why there would be a disconnect. So if more diverse and 
balanced project teams are more effective. And I think we have to make that logical leap that they would be. And yet we look at our project teams and they all look the same. Then there's every possibility that we're being less than effective in our project delivery. And that's quite a, quite a statement to stomach if you are in fact one of those, you know, uh, homogeneous project teams, because you think you're doing a great job and you want to do a great job. And somebody's saying to you, well, you may be, you, may, you, may, you might be able to make some changes that would make you more effective. Um, but we, we took that on. I'm really proud of the Major Projects Association for kind of leading the charge on this very much because um, it could have lost us some members, which it didn't. So we launched the Gender Balance Initiative in 2015, and it was very specifically around gender balance, and it was based on all this work that was coming out of McKinsey out of, out of America at the time. Um, and we, we challenged it head on. We said, look, we don't think there are as many women delivering major projects as there could be. And we think that's a problem. And we want to talk about it in a safe space with, with everybody that's doing this work. Um, so we have a couple of years of loads of events, loads of reports, uh, and a number of studies as well around the topic of, of gender balance in major projects. Um, a year ago, the board said, look, we, we think the time is right for us to expand this work uh, and broaden it out so that we're looking at all aspects of equality and diversity and inclusion and, and, and then looking at all different protected characteristics, not just sex. Um, so we've established that now. And what we're going to be doing now, because the diversity work has been going on for, for much longer than the sustainability, but we've created a nice model with our sustainability work. So we're going to set up a similar network of kind of diversity change makers or champions or something uh, to, to sort of mirror what we're doing on sustainability. Um, and that's a kind of a watch this space initiative. But, but because we see quite, you know, few women in, in project delivery, far too women, in, too few women in project delivery. And in honor of International Women's Day, which is on Tuesday, I want to highlight a report that we did a few years ago um, to just talk, to, to do a few highlights about <coughs> what actually works to improve gender balance in the workplace. Um, I, I know that um, there isn't quite the issue around gender imbalance within health and the NHS that there is in something like construction. Uh, but there are still issues. You know, I asked Mike for some uh, num figures on, you know, what the diversity of employees look like within the health sector. And of course, you get huge numbers of women working in this space. But what I noticed is that they don't, they're not getting promoted in the same proportions as, as men are. Um, so in honour of International Women's Day and with that in mind, I just want to run through briefly um, what, we find, what we found out. So this was right at the beginning of our gender balance initiative. Uh, and we got a group of people together and I said, you know, I don't, at the time, I know nothing about this. Tell me what works. And somebody said, well, there's no evidence of what works. It's all anecdotal. Um, and what we realized was that lots of organizations were doing exactly the opposite of what MPA tries to achieve. They were doing their own little undertakings in a bubble and not really sharing what they were doing. Uh, and trialing processes and there was no um, big picture view about how to improve equality and diversity. That has changed now and I'm proud to have been part of that change. Um, but this, this person said to us there's no clear evidence about what works. So we said right we're going to commission a study and we're actually going to look for that. Let's see if there is clear evidence about what makes a difference. So as I say, in honour of Tuesday, I'm going to run through some of these things for you. Uh, I'm not going to read it all out, but I'm just going to pick out some of the headlines. So I know there's been a pause in gender, gap pay, gender pay gap reporting, but we're back back onto that now. We're all, all needing to do that again. And 
those numbers will be really helpful. They help an organization to understand where the gaps are. They particularly help to understand where the issues are. So you may be, um, you, typically what your gender pay gap figures can tell you is whether you've got an issue with recruitment or, or promotion. Um, if you see lots of people on the lower scales and nobody on the higher scales, then it, typically it's because you're failing to promote uh, women to senior positions. <clears throat> so that, that data is fantastic and really helpful, and I recommend that you all look at it, but that you also have those difficult conversations about it. They're really hard because it forces you as, as leaders or as individuals working in this space to face the fact that there may be some imbalance and some inequality with how you make those decisions around pay and promotion. Um, and greater, if you can be as clear as possible about removing, uh, removing bias and increasing the transparency around what does it take to get from this grade to this grade in absolute terms, and then make sure that all those people that get there have clearly ticked those boxes, that there are no shortcuts for being, you know, the showman, yay, um, which often is what happens, I'm afraid. So greater clarity makes all the difference. But it really does take strong leadership to do that. Um, and I love this, this point in the middle. Uh, there's no silver bullet. Um, I've, I've heard an awful lot of people over the years say, unconscious bias training, we must all do unconscious bias training because it's brilliant and it makes us all lose our bias. Well, it doesn't. The thing about unconscious bias is it's unconscious and uh, you can be made aware of it um, and you can work really hard day in, day out to in, ensure that it's not unconscious, that it's up here in your conscious mind and that you're challenging yourself with it. But don't be fooled that you can put the whole organisation through unconscious bias training uh, and then tick that box and say, well, we're all brilliant now. Because um, not even Mary Poppins was perfect. Um, just a few more points on this. Um, and, and, I, and I say this, and I, I might be upsetting a few people, but believe me, Twitter posts of people smiling, lots of women smiling and doing the thumbs up on International Women's Day doesn't make a difference. You know, it, it raises a bit of awareness and it goes, yes, we're inclusive. But actually, if your organisation uh, does not have a culture of inclusion, um, next year, they'll all be different women doing that. So please think hard about the difference between raising a profile and, and social media campaigns and actually doing something that makes a difference. Having said that, there's a lot of great pra practice out there. You do not need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to sit down with a blank sheet of paper and say, what's going to work well, well for our project or our team? It's out there. You know, basic Google search will, will, will show you what it is. But a great place to start is to come to our website and see the resources that we've got there. Um, and, and you do need to ensure that the culture of the organization is inclusive. Recruiting thousands of women and then losing them after five years because you've got a culture which is not inclusive and supportive for them, uh, it, it's, it's not very wise and it's a big waste of money. Um, and the final point I want to say on this is that targets work. It's the very bottom point on that slide. I, I don't know if you can see it. Strong leadership and targets work. And I know a lot of people don't like setting targets because you know targets drive certain behaviors and they're not necessarily um, the right ones. But you don't have to publicly declare your target. You can have an internal target. It's a wish. Um, but, but like with all good projects, you need to see where you, where you need to go. You need to set the vision. And that's what these targets are all about. So be clear about your vision and what you want the organization or your team or your project to look like in a year's time, five years time, and work out how to get there. It's all about good project management. And I'm sure you are all brilliant at doing that. So that's the positive note that I want to finish on, Mike. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit short of time. Sorry, I, um, I didn't get time to time myself. So, uh, so we've got an extra 10 minutes, um, but hopefully that means we've got time for questions and then uh, people could go and have their brunch.
Thank you very much, Manon. That was absolutely brilliant, listening intently to you. And uh, I've been sharing the links as you requested and people have been looking at those. So thanks very much. We do have quite a few questions, actually. People have been voting on those. So I'm just going to go in in order, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And if for any reason um, we don't get time to go through them all, then um, would you be kind enough to... uh, to, to sure. share a response yeah of course oh, oh, what i might literally. do is write some things down and then i won't lose track yeah that's great so there's a question here I don't know who put it in but um what are your views on the human elements of delivering projects away from the discipline or ta- technical aspects of project management oh. that was voted top that one i'm afraid <laughs> well well, so the first thing I say is I'm not a project deliverer, right? I've never delivered a project in my life. I deliver the major projects association, but it's, a, it's an ongoing undertaking rather than a project. So with that proviso, but what I have done is I've spent the last 17 years doing nothing but talking about made project delivery. And what I have noticed is uh, that every single conversation we've had about the things that are very difficult in project delivery yeah. and not the technical aspects. Yeah. So the things that are really hard are yeah. all about people. Yeah. All about people. So I'll give you an example. So uh, Terminal 5 at Heathrow, technically they did everything right. What they didn't do right was communicate effectively with the baggage handlers such that they threw a wobbly on launch day and came out in strike. And and then the optics on Terminal 5 were all about this particular failure. But technically, it was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I think uh, you can't get away from the technical. If you get the technical stuff wrong, like if you're building a bridge, and you get the calculations wrong, you end up with that dodgy bridge that Arup built. <laughs> <laughs> the swinging bridge that they had to put right. Yes. So you, could, you have to have the technical expertise uh, in any project. So whether that's technology or engineering, construction, so on, so forth, or, or even the, uh, you're like a, you know, an IT project, something that the, perhaps the um, Department for Work and Pensions might work on, creating a new benefits website. You need to have that bit right. Yeah. But... Unless you've got the human aspect right, you, you can, you, it's like, I mean, you, you'll get this analogy in the health sector. Um, the operation was a success, but the patient died. So yeah. you can create something that technically is perfect and brilliant. But yeah. if it fails to deliver for your stakeholders, what's the point? Yeah, like absolutely. Building an empty hospital. Yeah, absolutely. You don't work well. Yeah, we obviously want a patient to live, don't we? Um, yeah. yeah. That, that's great. Yeah. Thanks, Manon. I'm going to take the next question here. From your experience, how can women empower themselves when running projects? Or how can women imp- empower themselves generally in the workplace? Well, take up powerlifting, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it, this is a... It, So I struggle with this question, but I still have an answer, a bit of an answer. So the reality is that the the responsibility for empowering anybody uh, has to come from the top. So, you know, junior staff can't can't give themselves a promotion. They can't give themselves Uh, more responsibility or or more authority in the workplace it has to come from the leaders the leaders are typically men even in a female dominated environment such as health the leaders are still men so i i am in favor of people trying to um, strengthen their position i'm not in favor of victim blaming so the reason that you're not a senior person is because you speak with a woman's voice or you know you should sit up more strongly in your there's there's an awful lot of um advice to women on how to project success in the workplace and it's all about saying well women if only you did this uh you you'd get ahead and and i don't think it's true i think it's kind of fiddling at the edges so i think the 
the big picture stuff is people in senior positions need to be really clear and really aware of who they're promoting and why. And if they're not promoting women in equal proportions to their representation across the workforce, then there's a problem. Because what it means is that there is a bias towards promoting men. Now, maybe it's because there's a belief that uh, you can only do a senior job full time and many of the women are working part time because they've got caring commitments. Right. What we've seen over the last two years is that everybody can work from home. Mm, you know, pretty yeah. much, you, you know, you can't yeah. on the on the front yeah. lines, but lots and lots of jobs can work from home. Lots of jobs can be done flexibly. So we need to break those decisions. Um, but women can do things for themselves. Uh, they can support one another in the workplace. And I think um, that's probably the best piece of advice I would give. Yeah. There was a, a fantastic story that came out of, I think, out of Obama's um, White House of the women in the White House supporting one another in meetings. So whenever a woman said something of interest and of value, instead of it dropping out of the conversation and being lost or being picked, you know, it's difficult to say this to a man, but sometimes this happens. Sometimes I can be in a meeting and I'll say, oh, oh we should do this. Deathly silent. Two minutes later, a man says, oh, we should do this. And I was, oh, that's a really good idea. Yeah. Mm. And then, um, you know, and, and, and I'm sure all the women on the call have experienced something similar to that. So, so don't let that happen to your, you know, your fellow female in the room. When they say something brilliant, you go, oh, yes. Yeah, that's a really good point that Sharon's just made. Or, you know, or if it gets repeated, you might say, oh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, didn't Sarah say that five minutes yeah. ago? Yeah. And just, just be there for one another. I think, you know, International Women's Day is, is not just about celebrating women and individuals, but, but of women themselves coming together. Um, yes. So do that. Don't try and worry about empowering yourself, but empower each other. Wow. It's yeah. a great lesson. Absolutely. That's lovely. That's great, Manon. Thank you. Um, so it looks like someone's been doing some research of their own. I understand the MPA celebrating their 40th year. Yay! How will, you be, how will you be celebrating and how can we get involved? Oh, right. So um, well, we're fo- we are focusing very much on members. Uh, so we're having a bit of a party next next month, a bit of a dinner for members. Um, the MPA team is also doing a, um, a sponsored walk. We're doing a 40 oh, kilometre right. sponsored walk to raise money for the Brain Tumour Trust. Actually, we, we lost a great friend of the association to a brain tumour uh, at the end of last year. So we're raising money for the Brain Tumour Trust. Right. I personally, and I'm putting this out there, I'm personally not walking. I'm I'm in the queue for a new hip. So I can't walk uh, 400 yards, much less for, for 40 kilometres. But um, That is a long way, 40 kilometres. Yeah, yeah, over two days. That's, yeah. uh, that's well, marathon's 42 kilometres, isn't it? Yeah. So 20, 26 miles and thereabouts. It's quite a walk. Oh, well, that's lovely. And yeah. they can so, find so, out... Yeah, have a look on our website. I think yeah, the blog yeah, just Twitter went on about that. it. And um, if you want to sponsor us, that'd be great. If you want to come and see us on the walk, that'd be great. We'd, we'd welcome some uh, some company. Excellent. Thanks, Manon. Uh, there are lots of other questions and we, we, we're kind of close to running out of time, I'm afraid. But um, are you happy to take another? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, in your view, what have been the biggest challenges for delivering major projects successfully over the last few years so I guess that's looking at what impact the pandemics had on people's ability to connect with each other and still still deliver things on time to budget and those other things what what sort of impacts or challenges have you seen well I think uh I think the the la- the loss of uh, key personnel due to Brexit has made a difference. So um, struggling, supply chain struggling to, to to just have the right number of people has been an issue. So so I think Brexit is having a is been biting, uh, particularly on on construction projects. Um, I actually think we've learned some valuable lessons around communication out of lockdown um, and the pandemic. What I've seen across our member organisations is um, people making more of an effort. So 
because chief because through zoom senior leaders can reach everybody they can talk to everybody face to face they've started doing it yeah. and all of a sudden the distance just di- disappears prior to that you'd have your chief executive would talk to their directors the directors would you know would cascade the conversations through managers managers and, and that that it was just expected that that would work and it doesn't work. Of course, it doesn't work effectively because, <laughs> yeah. you're, you know, it's like Chinese whispers. So what the message that gets down to the to the lower levels is not necessarily exactly what your chief exec has said. Um, but so we've we've managed to do that and to just reduce the distance between the top and the bottom of the of the organizations and massively improve, uh, improve that communication. We've also, I think, worked really, really hard on well-being. Yeah, we have, and, haven't we? Yeah. And I think prior to lockdown, there was this expectation you just cracked on with it. You know, so you get stressed. So, you know, projects are stressful places, crack on. But because we were so very, very aware of people's diminishing mental health, because they might just be working out of a bedroom or they might be stuck at home on their own in lockdown and not see each other, not see anybody for, for weeks on end, we've been really careful about about checking in with people on their well-being and and I think that will continue so whilst there's clearly been massive challenges and then lots of things have been delayed I think we can take two positives out of the last two years yeah absolutely 100 percent. and interestingly there's there's two questions about that I'm, I'm going to sort of use this is the last the, the last question for you but um how how do you balance that personal life with you know professional life you know you're a busy busy woman busy successful woman uh you know you you weight lift you you're very much part of the the project community how how do you manage it all um i don't do anything else (laughs) i have no social life (laughs) so um it's quite funny my friend said to me the other day oh look let's have a catch-up i'll phone you on friday and i i Actually, I only work four days for MPA. So this is my day off, actually. Right. But I love you so much, Mike. That's why oh. I thought it. But she said, "Well, I'll phone you Friday." I thought well, that's great because I'll be off in the afternoon. You can we can have a chat. She said eight o'clock. I thought, "What are you on about? Eight o'clock? I'll be in the gym." <laughs> Crazy. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't. I don't suggest that for everybody, doesn't it? I don't have children, so I don't have those pressures. But I, I am very, very firm about setting boundaries. So I've not been one of these people that struggled with having my work at home. You know, this is my living room. Look, beautiful. Um, I can switch the computer off. When it's off, it's off. And I think particularly as people have been working from home, we, we have to put those boundaries in. So for me, I say, well, look, I've got a, a national championships coming up. Unless I can train four times a week, I'm not going to be ready for that. And unless that, that means that I can't, have personal commitments or work commitments yeah. in those evenings yeah and so it's just black and white well when you know you start off with the things that you want to do so I have you know I love doing my job and I want to do it and those times are marked out and then my next priority is I have to train and I have to put in 10 hours of training so where's that going to fit mm. and then what's next and then I fit the knitting around that <laughs> I never got any time to talk to in my between, partner in like, between your sets <laughs> I, I, I have knitted on an exercise bike before have now really wow that's amazing that's multitasking yeah. yeah I was worried about the yarn getting caught up in the wheel so <laughs> I stopped <laughs> oh man and this has been absolutely fantastic there's still we've got I don't think I've seen as many questions in a in a session this week than I have oh, with okay. yours and um, that that says a lot about what people want to hear from you. So I'll I'll pop those over to you and yeah. find time to 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 course, um, put some uh, um, answers to those. We can share them out to people. Uh, but Thank thanks you. so much for for today. Um, You're very I've welcome. really enjoyed personally. I've really enjoyed chatting to you over the last couple of weeks to to make today's uh, session. Um, and I'd like to you know thank you for that. And uh, You're very welcome. Uh, hopefully we'll we'll do more of this together the MPA yeah. and, and it's yeah. just Project Futures and uh, hope so 
we'll we'll have a look at what people want to see and hear from you next and how they get involved in things and we'll, yeah. we'll look to do that yeah um, brilliantly. so thanks very much you're very welcome it's been a blast yes it has i've enjoyed it yeah all right i'm a big fan of waving yes me too love, <laughs> yeah. love that jazz hands uh, all right everybody <laughs> great to meet you enjoy your brunch yeah thanks manon cheers bye everyone take care see you soon <laughs>